history at the University of British Columbia, where he taught European and world history for 45 years. Chris is also a longtime member of Temple Shalom. And now over to you, Chris. Hey, thanks very much, uh, Larry and David, who's in the background doing some of the tech stuff. I, um, I want to really express my appreciation for being invited to give a talk uh, through the men's club. Uh, and I, you know, this is, it's only natural that in a, uh, in a Jewish congregation, uh, most of the lectures and talks of one sort or other that are given are um, uh, in some ways related to Jewish life and Jewish experience. But I actually think it's great that the men's club just takes the principle that um, uh, Jews are interested in a lot of things and uh, gives encourages that uh, there be talks about all sorts of subjects. And I, I'm, of course, very glad a lot of those talks are, are um, historical. So when I was contacted some months ago and invited to give a talk and uh, given the chance to suggest a topic, I, uh, I suggested this topic. Uh, there's nothing particularly Jewish about it, but it's a topic that I have given a lot of thought to over the years and that I often discussed uh, in one form or other with my students at UBC over the years when I was teaching modern European or especially modern world history. My, my own interest in this topic, uh, of course, partly relates to Winston Churchill. He's one of the most significant figures in 20th century history. And just about anyone who's interested in history is likely to have some interest in such a significant uh, personality. But it actually has almost more to do with my interest in India. India is a country I've been to five times, once for other extended stay. And uh, I've, on some of those occasions, I've given lectures at Indian universities, including, by the way, uh, two or three times when I gave lectures about German Jewish history, uh, something I'm an expert on. Um, but I also, of course, have gotten very interested in the history of India. And that's one of the reasons why this particular topic about Churchill in India is one that uh, I have found interesting over the years, and I hope you will find interesting. Just in a moment, we'll begin. I just want to say something technical. In a moment, I'm going to um, start sharing the slides I want to show everyone. And I think for most of you, it'll appear in a split screen situation. On the left side, I think you'll see the slides, and on the right side, you'll see me. But you don't really have to see me occupying 50% of the screen. I really would like to encourage you to uh, uh, make the slides bigger because there's some detail on them and so on. And you don't need my face to be for 50 minutes as big as the slides. I think usually with a split screen, there's a line down the middle that you can just slide over to the side and that makes the speaker smaller and the... Um, slides bigger. Some of you may have a, a, a setup where you are seeing the speaker down on the right, uh, right side with the speaker at the top, but you can also uh, maybe do something to just make sure you're not looking at the whole gallery of, of, uh, uh, of other members of the audience and sort of seeing, you know, who's fallen asleep and so on. <laughs> so uh, my basic point is there are things you can do that no one can do for you that you can do from home to make the slides the central thing you're looking at while I uh, discuss what I hope you find interesting about these slides and, and uh, try to communicate what, um, what I hope you will find interesting about this topic. So um, these are the uh, images that, um, uh, the first two images that I want you to kind of uh, introduce, what I'm using to introduce the topic. You will see these images again. This is the same man at two different times of his life. But um, let me begin by trying to express why I think this is an interesting topic. There is very much discussion these days about how to look at important historical figures who have been traditionally admired and celebrated, but who had significant blemishes in their careers that uh, make people concerned and self-conscious about the fact that there are 
statues on, of, of these figures or that there are um, uh, streets or schools or other places named after them. My uh, younger son went to Winston, Sir Winston Churchill Secondary School here in Vancouver. And uh, because people are reflecting, uh, we know this about the father of Canada, John A. Macdonald and countless other figures, uh, people are raising the question, should, should these people in the past be honored uh, in the way they have been honored in the past? And Winston Churchill is among those. Now, it's very, very important to emphasize, Churchill is chiefly admired and absolutely rightly so for being among the few British statesmen who recognized at an early stage the dangers of Hitler and Nazism and the danger that Hitler and the Nazis posed to the peace of Europe and the whole world, and who then led the struggle against Germany during those early phases of World War II, when with the help of just a few other countries, including notably Canada, uh, for over a, a year, Britain and a few other countries were the only countries in the world that were waging war on Germany. You know, the Soviet Union, the United States at that point were not. And uh, Churchill's leadership at that point is of historic importance in maintaining the struggle against the Nazi and the Nazi empire until those other countries joined the Second World War. So this is a rightly admired person in world history. At the same time, at the same time, Churchill is also bitterly and uh, in many ways quite fiercely condemned and in fact hated by some people because of his determination to try to preserve the British empire and prevent the British colonies in Africa and Asia from achieving independence. Now he was concerned about the British empire as a whole, but his most passionate emotions about the empire were in fact about the most populous part of the British empire, namely India. And that is what I'm gonna focus on in this lecture. Many people in India hated Churchill because of his hostility to independence for India, which was compounded in World War II by the failure of his government to take steps to diminish the terrible Bengal famine of 1943. And it is often stated that Churchill had racist ideas that influenced his attitude towards the British colonies in general and India in particular. And the fact is there is, there is certainly truth in that. But at the same time, Churchill's ideas and opinions about India were quite complex and were not, it's, it's inaccurate to simply say, well, he was of a generation where everyone was racist. This is a gross oversimplification of his rather complex ideas about the largest part of the British Empire. And that is, makes it worth thinking about. So to go right back to the beginning, not of the British Empire, but of Churchill. <laughs> Winston Churchill was born in 1874. And as I'm sure you know, he was born into one of the into the upper, upper crust of English society. His grandfather was one of the greatest dukes in England. His father was a major Tory politician. This map suggests the mental world that young Churchill grew up in. The British Empire, as we know, girdled the globe. There were some dominions like India, excuse me, sorry, like Canada or Australia or New Zealand where the number of white settlers steadily increased while the number of indigenous people was steadily declining, often due to terrible epidemics of diseases that were introduced from Europe. And in those dominions, the white settlers were being allowed to have self-government. But in the colonies of Africa and Asia, where indigenous people were predominated in terms of numbers, the situation was very different. And by far the largest and most important of these colonies was, of course, India, British India. British India was huge in those days. It included what today are five separate countries. This map now includes India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Burma, 
and Sri Lanka. But so India is a big country today, but India was much bigger when it was British India. Keep that in mind as we go through the story. So we'll go back to Churchill. Churchill, like most young English aristocrats, Churchill was sent to a very prestigious boarding school. The most prestigious one in England is, of course, Eton. But Harrow was almost as important and highly regarded. And not surprisingly, most of the students, there was only, only boys, most of the students, that still is in a lot of those schools, most of the students were, of course, English. But there were some students from the colonies, and including India, as long as they came from upper class families that had adopted English dress and English mannerisms. About a decade after Churchill graduated, a student at Harrow was Jawaharlal Nehru, who was the son of a very prominent Brahmin lawyer named Motilal Nehru, who was uh, uh, very uh, involved in the whole British system of law and justice, and was just his son was just the kind of person it was appropriate, considered appropriate by the headmaster of Harrow to. Um, allowed to be a student there. Um, meanwhile, going back a few years, at the same time that Churchill was a 14-year-old student at Harrow, a slightly older Indian law student, Mohandas Gandhi, was studying law at the Middle Temple at the Inns of Court in London, because in fact the British wanted Indian trained lawyers Indian young men who were trained as lawyers in England to return to India and be able to function as uh, people like Nehru's father did in the British court system of the British Empire in India. Anyway, Churchill graduated from Harrow in uh, a few years after this picture was taken. He did not go to university. Instead, he signed up for the army. He was very ambitious and he was highly selective in which subjects he was good at. He was a good student in certain subjects because he loved them and he wasn't particularly strong in a lot of the others. Uh, so instead of struggling with the university where fluency in Latin and Greek was uh, sine qua non at that point, uh, Churchill instead signed up for the army. He signed up and he became a member. He was very well connected. It wasn't that hard for him to get a commission as a young, low grade officer. So he signed, he became a member of the fourth Queen's own Hussars. And in September, 1896, uh, his uh, whole regiment uh, arrived in India and he stayed there with one long interruption. Churchill stayed in India until the summer of 1898. Now the regiment was posted to Bangalore, which is in South India. Churchill spent some of his time doing his job as an officer, supervising soldiers, a lot of time playing polo. At one point he got interested in collecting butterflies but by and large, on the long, hot afternoons, they did all the military drill in the morning and the, before the days got too hot. And then on those long, hot afternoons, when most of the officers would sit around playing cards or playing pool or whatever, he would sit in his barracks reading books like Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire or other great British works of European history and literature. But, you know, nothing much was really happening in South India. And Churchill was desperate to see some real military activity. He was very ambitious. He wanted to establish a reputation, not just as someone who had belonged to a regiment, but who had really been involved in the, the wars of the British Empire. So he pulled some strings, as I say. He was a grandson of one of the greatest dukes in England and so on. He knew the right people. He pulled some strings and got himself temporarily attached to a different military unit called the Malakand Field Force that was pulled together from other units of the British, uh, of the army in India. And it was being sent to suppress a tribal rebellion in the Malakand district on the so-called Northwest frontier of British India. This is the mountainous region we hear a lot about today. It's the area 
uh, that is uh, basically what today are the countries of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And Pashtun or Pathan tribesmen were attacking some British outposts. Now Churchill really wasn't uh, given military assignments there. He was there as an observer, but he did see some dramatic military action and a battle with which the British almost lost. And then he wrote articles about what he was experiencing that was published back home in Britain. And uh, not much later, he wrote a whole book about all this uh, called the Malacan Field Force in which he reported uh, everything that had been done. And you know, I, I haven't read this whole book, but I've read the opening chapters and especially the first chapter is very revealing. It, it, it shows the influence of Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman empires. It actually, to my mind, sounds like what Gibbon would have written if he, instead of writing about the Romans confronting the Germanic tribes on the outer limits of the Roman empire, Gibbon was writing about uh, the British confronting tribes on the outer limits of the British empire. And uh, you could just see how Churchill uh, picked up his style of analysis from a great historian, but applied it to this very different activity. And it became a very popular book at the time. And all this also gave Churchill the feeling, the idea that he knew the country, he knew something about India. And he thought he really understood India, whatever it means to really understand a great big complicated country like that. Anyway, he then uh, uh, he left India to go to South to go to Africa. He was first to the Nile region and involved in military, very important military activity there. Went to South Africa. He also he made a famous escape from the enemies in the South African War and wrote about that and became very famous. And by 1900, he was uh, he'd gotten home and was um, uh, was considered a, a rising young man with an interesting military and journalistic background and became elected in 1900 as a member of parliament. He was originally a conservative, but within a few years he switched to the liberal party. And then when the liberals came to power in 1905, Churchill as a rising political star was immediately appointed under secretary for the colonies. That was the job he was given under Secretary of State for the colonies. Now, this job actually had nothing to do with India because there was India was such a big part of it, it was by far the most important colony. There was a whole separate department of government devoted to India, but um, Churchill was uh, quite busy uh, dealing with various things having to do with South Africa, where he'd spent a little while. Uh, and that was the point when efforts were being made to hammer out the arrangements for what eventually became the Union of South Africa. Now, in this connection, being part of his portfolio was dealing with South African issues. And if they were really important, of course, referring them up to, to the minister himself. In this connection, Churchill happened to meet the person who became the most famous Indian of the 20th century. At that point, a young man, Mohandas Gandhi, who was, as you will know, uh, spending many, many years of his young life living in South Africa. And he came as part of a delegation to London to try to get the British government to protect the rights of the Indians, the South Asians living in South Africa in the new constitution of what was being worked out for the Union of South Africa. And this young man was a, granted a brief audience with, the, uh, with Under Secretary Churchill. Now, we can take for granted that Gandhi was dressed very properly in the dark suit and the tie, which uh, was what he wore in those days. He had, after all, been a law student and now was a young lawyer, a British law student, a young lawyer in South Africa. And as an articulate British trained lawyer, he probably made a very good presentation. In the end, it didn't amount to much. But Churchill evidently listened politely, made an equivocal reply. Gandhi left. Churchill actually seems to have hardly remembered this encounter, but Gandhi remembered it. Now, Churchill was soon transferred to other jobs. He was rising up the ranks 
don't worry, even if this was an undergraduate class, I would have said, don't worry, this won't be on the exam, but just to show you, um, uh, he rose up from the job he started under secretary for so the colonies, he became president of the Board of Trade, home secretary, first Lord of the Admiralty, which was the job he was holding when World War I broke out. Uh, then he got, uh, was out of government for a few months, came back as Minister of Munitions, uh, all of this while he was very preoccupied uh, with other issues. He wasn't thinking much about India in those days. But then, then in 1919, Churchill was named Secretary of State for War. And when that happens, India comes very importantly back into his consciousness. Now, right after World War I, there was considerable political unrest in India. And the reason is that the British passed some minor reforms in the way India was going to be governed, but they also passed some draconian new laws that imposed very harsh punishments on anyone who was expressing political dissent. And that led to protests all over India by people who were saying, you know, the British keep saying that they're, they're training us in the principles of democracy, but they're crushing our democratic rights with these very harsh laws. And particularly in the North Indian city of Amritsar, one of the main cities of the Punjab, uh, there was tremendous amount of political agitation and crowds were gathering and the protests were getting very, very dynamic. And at one point, General Reginald Dyer, and this is a name that you'll see it becomes important, who was sent with troops to suppress the disturbances in Amritsar. And at one point, uh, Dyer's people had gone around the city saying there's going to be a curfew. Very few people have heard the announcement. And there were thousands of people gathered in this large space in India. Some of them weren't political at all. They were there for a religious festival and it was the only place they could pitch their little tents. Others were political people listening to political speeches. No one had heard anything about a curfew. And at one point, Dyer knew that a lot of people were gathered there. He marched his troops into this enclosed area, which actually only had one outlet, one entrance, and was surrounded by a wall. And uh, Regarding this as a political disturbance, he ordered his troops to fire on all the people in this open space called the Jallianwala Bagh. And as soon as the firing began, people desperately looked for shelter and there was none and they couldn't escape. There were no escape routes. And as a result, uh, easily 400 people and probably many more were killed over a thousand were wounded. And this was came instantly to be known in India as the Amritsar massacre. And in fact, this was a turning point in Indian history. You know, until then, British trained leaders like Nehru and Gandhi, who had now returned a few years earlier from South, in, uh, South Africa, Indian trained leaders like Nehru and Gandhi simply wanted to have the British grant more political rights to India so that India could gradually maybe move towards becoming a self-governing part of the British Empire like Canada or Australia and so on. But in the aftermath of this massacre, the national leaders in India like Gandhi and like Nehru decided that a gradual step-by-step -step increase in self-rule within the British Empire was no longer relevant. India should become independent, period. And as an expression of this, they also stopped wearing British style clothing. And increasingly, they wore only simple cotton clothing made in India. In fact, Gandhi, you've all seen pictures of Gandhi spinning cotton. And it was to say, look, we don't have to depend on Brit British factories to uh, manufacture clothing for us. We can spin our own cotton, keep it here in India, manufacture simple clothing and get out of the whole economic relationship with India as part of our becoming an independent nation. But meanwhile, the massacre that had happened was widely discussed and debated. In India, there was overall tremendous aversion to what General Dyer had done, except by the 
British in India who said this man was the savior of the Punjab. The Punjab was going to turn into a total hotbed of revolution if he hadn't done what he did. But um, other people in India called him the butcher of Amritsar. And um, right after this all happened back in India, a commission had been established to investigate this whole affair and recommend whether uh, what to be done, and they finally decided, well, uh, Dyer was doing his duty, but uh, we should ask that he retire, but not punish him. And this in turn led to a big debate back home in, in London in the House of Commons in July of 1920, because um, there were some people in the House of Commons who said, why, did, why was he forced to retire? He did what needed to be done to restore order peace and order and law and security in India, other people in the parliament, you know, they said he should be thanked for what he did for our empire. Other people in the parliament said, no, this was a wanton attack on unarmed people and so on. Now, who was the secretary of state for war at this point? It was Winston Churchill in charge of British military matters. And he had to make the main speech on behalf of the government and his point was, he felt that the government could admittedly not reverse the decision that, that Dyer should not be punished, but he wanted to make clear that the government felt that what Dyer had done was wrong. And Churchill's speech in the House of Commons on the Amritsar massacre included some passages that became very famous. This is what he said. He said, and this is part of what he said. He said, a tremendous fact stands out. The slaughter of nearly 400 persons and the wounding of probably three or four times as many at the Jallianwala Bagh. This is an episode which appears to me to be without precedent or parallel in the modern history of the British Empire. It's an event of an entirely different order from any of those tragic occurrences that take place when troops are brought into collision with the civil population, because it's an extraordinary event, a monstrous event, an event which stands in singular and sinister isolation. Men who take up arms against the state must expect to be fired upon, yes. But at Amritsar, the crowd was neither armed nor attacking. Now, Churchill's speech was very admired in certain circles in England. But the reaction in India was very different. People didn't say, look at this politician who's, who's saying how terrible the Amritsar massacre was. Their idea was that the massacre was not an event without precedent or parallel in the modern history of the British Empire. It's not an event that stood out in isolation. They thought it was an entirely typical answer of what colonial rule is all about and nothing would change until colonial rule itself simply came to a complete end. Now, throughout the 1920s, as this nationalist movement led by Gandhi with a tremendous support from Nehru and of course countless other people, as it became more and more prominent in India, Churchill back home in England continued to think about India, but he was no longer the main focus he became a conservative again. He was a conservative, had been a liberal, now he's a conservative again. For uh, in 1925, the, uh, uh, the liberal, the conservatives came back to power and Churchill as a leading conservative now became, uh, got the second highest position in the British government, the chancellor of the exchequer. So he, he was thinking about economic policy. Then came 1929. And in 1929, the conservatives were voted out of power that meant Churchill was no longer in the cabinet. And the new Labour government, headed by Ramsay MacDonald, they had a favor, a, a policy of granting more self-government for India within the, within the British Empire. And in fact, it was announced that the eventual goal of British policy was for India to become a self-governing dominion like Canada or like Australia. Then in 1931, there was another change. A coalition government was formed, which in fact, the conservatives were the main members of that coalition. Uh, but some of the Labour Party joined the coalition and one of them was MacDonald, who therefore as a courtesy was kept on as the prime minister. And that new government 
that coalition government continued the policy of step-by-step -step increases in, India, in Indian self-government. But Churchill was not part of this government. He was a conservative, but he was left out of this coalition government. And one of the main reasons was that Churchill had already started now to become deeply engaged in a movement to oppose any more concessions to the Indian nationalist movement. In fact, he became one of the leading lights of something called the Indian Empire Society. And he made a string of speeches in 1930 and 1931 to articulate his position. So all the texts of these speeches have of course survived and I've tried to meet a lot of them and to read a lot of them. So what were, some of Churchill's main arguments for opposing any further extension of any form of self-government to India. Now, first, like many Europeans of his generation, he was a passionate believer in what was generally called the civilizing mission of the European empires. The idea that the British, the French, and the other European powers are out there in the rest of the world because they would bring the Christian values and the economic superiority of European civilization to these underdeveloped culturally, civilizationally, economically, and socially underdeveloped countries of Africa and Asia. But actually, although Churchill thought it was important to do this, he also did not believe that these populations would ever really catch up with the Western world, never reach the European level of civilization, and therefore um, the empire should be there to stay. And in the case of India, he also believed that the special demographic conditions of India meant that it would be impossible for India ever to rule itself because he believed that the hostility between Hindus and Muslims was so pervasive and so bitter that these two groups would never be able to live in harmony. They would always need the strong, impartial, steadying hand of British rule to prevent them from tearing each other apart. Now, Churchill knew that the Hindus of India were numerically dominant, but he didn't see the Hindus as a unitary group. He was very aware of the caste system. He felt that the caste system was one where the higher castes, above all the Brahmins, systematically oppressed the lower castes, especially those who were in fact so low in the Hindu caste system that they didn't even count as members of a caste. This is the group known in Churchill's day in English as the untouchables, not a term anyone uses now, and now referred to as by themselves as Dalits. And in his speeches, Churchill kept expressing sympathy for the members of this downtrodden group at the very bottom of the caste system. Now, Churchill assumed without really any basis, here's where he thought he knew things that he didn't know. Churchill assumed without any real basis, in fact, that if India became self-governing, then the Brahmins would completely control the government of a self-governing India. Now, many Brahmins who were highly educated, very many of the students who went to schools like Harrow, uh, the Indian students were Brahmins. Nehru was a good example. Many of the Brahmins were highly educated. Some of them had acquired a sophisticated knowledge of Western ideas and literature. But Churchill considered the Brahmins of India as hypocrites. And having being Churchill, he expressed these views with the usual rhetorical skill he had and ferocious sarcasm that he was capable of. In one of his speeches, this is what Churchill said, to abandon India to the rule of the Brahmins would be an act of cruel and wicked negligence. These Brahmins who mouth and patter the principles of Western liberalism and pose as philosophic and democratic politicians are the same Brahmins who deny the primary rights of existence to nearly 60 millions of their own fellow countrymen whom they call untouchable and whom they have for thousands of years actually taught to accept this sad position. 
They won't eat with these 60 millions, nor drink with them, nor treat them as human beings. They consider themselves contaminated even by their approach. And then in a moment, they turn around and begin chopping logic with John Stuart Mill or pleading the rights of man with Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You know, Churchill, whatever you want to think about, it was one of the great rhetoricians of the 20th century. It's a bit of a challenge to just quote his words and give you even a hint of what it sounded like to be standing there in a hall in, 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 in London and give speeches saying things like this. Now, the British government wasn't happy about all the stuff that Churchill was doing because they were committed to uh, more self-government for India. They hosted a series of what were called roundtable conferences in London where British and Indian representatives would were supposed to hammer out a basis for the future political organization of India. The first of these conferences ended in failure, but the second one, 1931, people thought maybe would be more successful because it was attended by uh, Mohandas Gandhi who, uh, Gandhi, who is by now being called by many people Mahatma Gandhi because he'd already acquired this reputation of Mahatma, a man with a great soul. Um, the second conference was attended by Mahatma Gandhi with a lot of fanfare. And at one point he made a visit. He called on the prime minister uh, in Downing Street. And he made a point of dressing in the simple Indian cotton cloth that he always wore. Often it was cloth he'd woven himself to make the point that Indians need not depend on getting their clothing from the clothing factories of Britain. From the, he, we don't need the British textile mills. Look, we can make all our own simple clothing. And that's what he wore to 10 Downing Street. But Churchill was clearly very offended that Gandhi would meet, would visit the prime minister of the United Kingdom dressed in this inappropriate way. And in fact, in a famous speech, not referring only to this visit, but in general, in a famous speech, he referred to a situation where Gandhi had appeared in New Delhi at the vice, the British Viceroy's palace dressed just like this. And this is what Churchill said. It is alarming and also nauseating to see Mr. Gandhi, a seditious middle temple lawyer, now posing as a fakir of a type well-known in the East, striding half naked up the steps of the vice regal palace while he is still organizing and conducting a defiant campaign of civil disobedience to parley on equal terms with the representative of the king emperor. Anyway, back in London, the conference which Gandhi attended dressed like this also ended in failure because no agreement could be reached. The British government simply decided they draft a very long piece of legislation on their own, which they submitted to parliament in 1935. And it was gonna be called, if it was a government of India bill and they hoped it would become the government of in India act in 1935. It was framed, it no longer reflected any negotiations with the British, with the Indian leaders, it was just written by the British government. It included a lot of clauses which the British government hoped would move India somewhat closer to self-government, while at the same time making sure to keep British power safely supreme in India. There would be elected provincial legislatures with considerable power over many aspects of social and economic life. There would be a federal legislative body which would be partly elected, but partly appointed by the British. There would be an Indian government with many ministers who were Indians, but the British Viceroy and the British officials would retain control of military affairs, of foreign relations, and they would have all sorts of powers of veto and intervention to ensure that the last word would always be held by the British authorities. This was of no interest to Indian nationalist leaders like Gandhi, like Nehru, who uh, were then the universally regardless, the two most prominent 
uh, in the nationalist leaders, and there were many others, they wanted the British to hand over power and leave plain and simple. But the British government did submit this act to the British parliament, began the whole process of having it considered by various committees and by the full House of Commons and so on. It was a very long piece of legislation, supposedly the longest act drafted by any British government up to that time. There was no question that in the end it would actually pass because the government commanded a large majority it, it, it would also, this government would also be supported by most of the Labour Party who were not part of the government except for a few of them like MacDonald. Um, uh, but they, um, uh, they were members of parliament, particularly conservative members who were fiercely opposed to this legislation. And of course they were led by Churchill. He, this, he was the leader of the conservatives, the Tories opposing this government, which was this uh, legislation, I mean, that was being put forth by the majority of the Tory party that he belonged to. And it's most important of the many speeches was given in the House of Commons, February 11th, 1935. Back when I used to teach this topic in, uh, at UBC, uh, I would have my students read the whole speech. Uh, I will spare you that, believe me. <laughs> but I want to give you a little sense of what was said in Churchill's speech, because uh, to get some idea, whatever else you might think about it, it was a remarkable piece of political rhetoric. Now, much of his speech pertained to the details of this enormous, cumbersome piece of legislation, but he was more concerned to go at the fundamental premises of this bill. He was sure that the policy of the British government was disastrously wrong and would be harmful to Britain and India alike. He was convinced that weakening British control would undermine the very peace and stability of India. In his own words again, he, was, uh, he said, uh, our government is incomparably the best government that India has ever seen or ever will. The Indians, whatever their creed, would rather have their affairs dealt with in many cases by British courts and British officers than by their own people. Any Hindu would prefer to have his case dealt with by a British officer than by a Mohammedan and vice versa. And then because Churchill never passed up a chance to take a jab at Gandhi, he was quick to add, and talking about going to people of your own race and language and so forth. When Mr. Gandhi had his appendix removed, he was very careful to insist upon a British surgeon. Churchill was fully aware of the strong arguments that were being made against his point of view. He had to rebut them. One argument was that for Britain to rule India, or in fact, any other part of the empire was simply undemocratic. The other argument was that the British were aliens in India and did not have the moral right to rule over the people of another country. Churchill rejected these arguments and they reveal a lot about his fundamental values. He began by responding to a question that had been put to him earlier in the debate, which was, do you or do you not believe in democracy? You'd think it was obvious what Churchill would say, but this is what he replied. This is what he said. This is my feeling about democracy. I accept it. But I am a good deal more doubtful whether democracy believes in parliamentary institutions. We have only to look across the channel in Europe to see how democracy tends in its present manifestation to be injurious to the parliamentary system and to the personal liberties which are dear to the liberal heart. Now, his, this is 1935, his audience would of course have known exactly what he was thinking about when he said that. This was a time when Mussolini had long since come to power in Italy through the democratic parliamentary system. And even more recently and even more dramatically, just two years earlier, Hitler had come to power in Germany through the institutions of parliamentary democracy. And with months, within months, he had turned Germany into a one-party totalitarian police state. Churchill kept returning to this fundamental point 
that he wanted to make about India and at the same time what was going on in Europe. He said, of course, we are confronted with the old choice of self-government versus good government. We are urged to believe that the worst self-government is better than the best good government. And his reply was that between self-government and good government, good government was better. And only the British could give good government to India. Then there was that other argument that upset him, the argument that the British simply had no right to take over a foreign country like India. This is what he said. I was sorry to read of a high military officer in India, meaning a high British military officer in India, speaking of us, the British, as aliens. The Lord President here in Britain made a reference to the Indians having an increasing preference for putting their confidence in men of their own race and language. I am very sorry to hear of this downcry of our national credit. None of this is true. It's utterly untrue. We are no more aliens in India than the Mohammedans are or the Hindus themselves. We have as good a right to be in India as anyone there except perhaps the depressed classes who are the original stock. Now, what did he mean by that? We are not aliens any more than the Mohammedans or the Indians. Well, what he meant was this, and this is correct. The original inhabitants of India were what are often referred to as the Dravidians. Then about 3000 years ago, Aryans started invading India, coming over the Himalayas from Asia, and they brought with them the Hindu religion, which gradually spread through the rest of India. Then around the year 1200, Muslims had started to come to India and they eventually created the magnificent Mughal Empire, which ruled most of India for 200 years. Then the British came. They eventually built up the great British Raj. So his argument was the only true non aliens of India were the descendants of the original Dravidian people many of whom in Churchill's understanding of Indian history had been turned into the untouchables. This was a theme that Churchill returned to in the final words of his speech. He knew by then, actually he knew by then, of course he knew that his opposition would fail. He knew the bill would pass, but he still wanted to go on record as saying, we should try instead to instill in the minds of the people of Britain and of India a different and a new conception of the relations between these two countries. We hope for once and for all to kill the idea that the British and India are aliens moving with many apologies out of the country as soon as they've been able to set up any kind of governing organism to take their place. We should try to inculcate this idea that we are there forever as honored partners with our Indian fellow subjects whom we invite to join with us in the functions of government for their own lasting benefit and our own. Well, of course, he knew this anyway. All this came, all this rhetoric came to nothing. The government had the votes it needed and soon passed the Government of India Act. And India got slightly, slightly more self-government. Of course, people in India were not at all satisfied with this. Most people in India were not at all satisfied with this because this extension, as you could see from the slide I showed a few slides ago, this so-called extension of self-government really left all the final decisions in the hands of the British government anyway. But Churchill thought this was a step by step movement, which would steadily result in the diminution of British power. And he felt he had at least explained why that was so objectionable. Well, that was 1935. In the next few years, Churchill's attention shifted more and more totally to the events in Europe. These are the famous years when he was struggling desperately against the appeasement policies of the 
uh, British government, uh, 1937, uh, Neville Chamberlain became the prime minister and was committed to uh, making deals with Germany so that there wouldn't be another world war. Despite all that, as we all know, in 1939, the second world war broke out in Europe. Churchill came back into the cabinet First, as uh, the same job he had at the beginning of World War I, as many of you will know, he now had at uh, the beginning of World War II, first Lord of the Admiralty. Then there was a tremendous crisis in 1940 when the Germans invaded Norway and then were invading France. And it became clear to everyone, almost everyone, that Neville Chamberlain had been a dismal failure. And that was the point at which Churchill became prime minister. Now, his number one priority all through these years was, not surprisingly, winning the war uh, that he was waging first against Germany and later Japan enters the war. But he was hoping during these years that the nationalists in India would suspend their anti-British activities, at least for the duration of the war, in return some, for some vague promises of uh, more constitutional discussions after the war would be over. But of course, this did not happen. And the nationalists in India said, no, we can't trust the British to give any meaningful concessions after the war. It's time for them to leave India and leave India right now. In 1942, in the middle of the war, Gandhi launched the Quit India movement. And this is a poster. Uh, uh, you, I, I, this is something that's probably a little hard to find on the internet. I actually took a picture of this when I was in the uh, Nehru's home, what had been his home in later years in New Delhi, and there was an exhibit. And it shows Nehru and Gandhi trying to ride Churchill and the British Viceroy out of India. This was their program. Leave India now. Leave everything. Simply leave now. And it was because of Gandhi's powerful commitment to nonviolence. It was a completely nonviolent campaign. But the goal was to have India free of the British then and there. Well, the British, this was well, a war was going on, a war with Japan, and Japan was sending armies that were getting closer and closer to India. So the British considered this extremely dangerous. And the British arrested Gandhi and the other leaders and crushed the movement. British rule stayed in force. In fact, in his famous speech in 1942, no, uh, November 1942, at Mansion House, that was the official residence of the Lord Mayor of London. Church made a statement that he's often quoted, I'm sure you're familiar with this, he said, I have not become the king's first minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. And it's a phrase he liked, so he repeated it a number of times in other speeches. Now, these were very difficult years for India. 1943, a major food crisis began in the heavily populated province of Bengal, and, uh, uh, and I'll show you on the map where that is. Um, Bengal had traditionally had gotten most of its rice from another part of the British Empire, in fact, part of British India for, from almost all the, that time, called Burma then. Uh, rice from Burma, which is here, was easily shipped to Bengal, which is here. But by now, 1943, most of Southeast Asia, including Burma, had been conquered by the Japanese, who certainly wouldn't allow any rice to cross the border into the British controlled parts of India, which was most of India, and uh, who were considered to have an eye on getting more and more control of India. Now, there were, as a result of this, tremendous food shortages in, in Bengal. The, the whole economic system was to get most of the rice from Burma, and that supply was cut off. All over India, there were at this point adequate rice supplies 
that in principle could have been sent to Bengal. But this didn't happen because the British authorities were waging a world war and they felt all of their transportation arrangements had to serve the purpose of war against both Japan and Germany rather than serve internal Indian food redistribution needs. Some food was actually shipped from India to other parts of the British Empire. Now the British cabinet, which was of course headed by Churchill was informed about this growing food crisis in Bengal, but insisted that war priorities had to remain unchanged. They had to win the war against Japan and against uh, Hitler and then um, uh, and Mussolini, uh, they were still fighting Mussolini, but um, they, he bowed out of the war later. Um, the war against Hitler and the war against Japan was the priority. And once they defeated these countries, they could then worry about other things. Defeating Hitler especially was all that mattered. Well, the food shortages in Bengal turned into outright famine and it's estimated that at least 2 million people died of hunger in those years. And it's hardly surprising that very many people in India continued to blame the British government and specifically because he was the head of the British government, Churchill, for this disaster. In 1949, the war ended. Now, Churchill had famously said he did not want to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire, but something else got liquidated in 1945, and that was Churchill's own government, which was voted out of power in July of 1945 and replaced by the Labour Party government under Clement Attlee. And under Attlee's Labour government, partly due to the realization that there were tremendous economic problems in post-war Britain and Britain couldn't even afford to run a huge empire anymore. Under the Labour government, the liquidation of the empire that Churchill had feared soon began and it began with India. What had been British India was now divided between India, a, a new country to be called India, plus Pakistan, which at that point had two parts, East and West Pakistan. Ceylon was granted independence. Burma would become independent. And um, uh, India became an independent country on August 15th, 1947. Nehru became India's first prime minister. For a few years, India still had a British governor general but that didn't last. In 1950, India became a republic and the last small symbol of British imperialism in South Asia was now totally gone. But even before that happened, in 1948, something dreadful happened in India and that was the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Great Soul Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated by an extreme Hindu who felt that Gandhi was too soft on Muslims. All over the world, statesmen and other public figures issued long statements of tribute and condolences and admiration for Gandhi, for everything he had done for the world, for his whole philosophy of nonviolence and everything else. Churchill's comment was very short, very terse. I am shocked at this wicked crime, as no doubt he was, but he didn't say more. And I think he knew that anything he said in praise of Gandhi would be regarded by people who remembered the things he'd said about Gandhi all through the years as insincere. And Churchill was simply too honest for doing that. Now, Churchill came back to power was voted back into office in 1951. By then, India was not only ind independent, it was uh, totally disconnected, it remained in the Commonwealth of, of Nations, but it was a totally independent republic. Churchill accepted this as the new reality. It happened, he was deeply unhappy about it, but it had happened and you gotta face facts and move forward. And in fact, he did have a respectful relationship with 
the new prime minister of India with Nehru. And in the first place, Churchill had never felt the visceral animus that he'd always felt towards Gandhi that he, in his feelings about Nehru. But I actually suspect that there was another reason, not the only reason, of course, but there was another reason that he felt he could interact with Nehru in a way that he never could have interacted with Gandhi as he was seen doing here when he was not in the government, when he was the leader of the opposition and Nehru was in London and called on the prime minister and called on the leader of the opposition. And when Nehru came to London, he was willing to switch from Indian clothing to Western clothing appropriate for meeting with British statesmen. Gandhi never did that. He was gonna wear his simple cotton cloth no matter where he went in London, including the very residence of the prime minister. Nehru was more tactful that way. He dressed this way when he visited the West, especially when he visited Britain and church that probably gave Churchill a different attitude. And in, indeed Churchill found himself thinking about this whole issue in his old age, Churchill occasionally mused but perhaps it might have been advisable for the British to have adopted a less condescending attitude towards the Indians. But his core belief never really changed. He was always sure that Britain had had a great mission to perform in India, and he was sorry that history had not unfolded in a way that allowed that mission to be carried forth. That's the basic summary of the whole topic Churchill and India. It's not quite the end of what needs to be said. Because what about now? Churchill continues to be revered, and rightly so, as the man who more than any other political figure, in, especially in the crucial years from 1940 to 1941, saved the Western world from Hitler and the Nazis. If you had to point to one political leader who more than any other in that critical period when Britain was trying to, through the Battle of Britain, invade the British Isles, add them to the part of Europe, the parts of Europe controlled by the Nazis, would have been a disaster for Western civilization. And during these years before the first the Soviet Union when it was attacked by the Germans and then the US when it was attacked by Japan and when Germany then declared war on the US. Um, during that critical year or year 1940 and 1941, if any one person kept Western civilization going, if you can say that one person can do such a thing, one would point to Churchill. It was his greatest achievement or paraphrase his own words, paraphrase his own words, it was the words he applied to the uh, Royal Air Force could be applied to Churchill. That was his finest hour. Well, it's hardly surprising that in Parliament Square in London, right in front of the Houses of, of Parliament, in front of the House of Commons, where he was a member for over 50, almost 60 years, there is a statue of Churchill. And more recently, around 2015, a statue of Gandhi was also placed there. But to many people, Churchill's attitude towards the British Empire in general and India in particular were expressions of racist feelings of superiority and they cannot be overlooked or forgiven. Gandhi, by the way, has also been attacked as a racist. And it is true that during those years when he was a lawyer in South Africa, when he was fighting very hard for the rights of South Asians, Indians living in South Africa, he certainly made remarks about the black inhabitants, the African inhabitants of South Africa that sounded quite racist. So not surprisingly, look what has happened repeatedly to the statue of Churchill and the statue of Gandhi on Parliament Square in London. The words, Churchill was a racist, have been smeared on the base of Churchill's statue. And 
placards, as you can see, have been wrapped around his, his coat, uh, expressing the position that Churchill was a racist um, in his whole attitude towards the British colonies. And Gandhi's statue has also had white paint splashed across it, while posters calling Gandhi a racist have been set up nearby. And as a result of this, and you know how controversial statues are, as a result of this, when political demonstrations are anticipated, the statues of Churchill and Gandhi in Parliament Square now get frequently boarded up to reduce the opportunity for people to deface these statues. This is a very strange way to end a lecture on Churchill. I'm not going to tell you what to think about these statues. I'm a historian, I'm not a moralist, but it is worth thinking about what position one should take about remembering great personalities of the past whose actions and words appear from the perspective of the present to be things that were not consistent with the greatness that we attribute to them. And that may or may not be something that people want to comment on. I'm now going to stop sharing the slides, see if any chat questions have yet been posted. It looks like everyone was listening and not chatting, but right away, here is the first question. I, I could possibly read the question um, because I can see the chat. I can see, uh, unless Sir David or Larry feels it's important for them to read the questions aloud, I think uh, you can interrupt me if you feel, but I could also read this question and if uh, it go looks ahead, like Chris, go ahead. to do it another way. So, Chris, go ahead, uh, go ahead. Well, I'm not gonna do anything, I'll take a sip of water. Now I will read the first question, it's from Mike, Mike Levitt. What was Churchill's attitude towards Israel or the founding of a Jewish state? Oh my gosh, that's off topic. <laughs> it was, um, I, I, I really won't try to answer that question. I will acknowledge the importance of that question. And it's a question that has a lot to do with the British empire. Churchill was involved, very involved in, uh, because at one point he, after being, before he was minister of state for war, he was a minister of state for colonies and, and that same post-war period uh, around the same time, but he wasn't doing two jobs at once. Um, he was very involved in the whole reorganization of what had been major parts of the Ottoman Empire and setting up the kingdom of uh, what later became the kingdom of Jordan and setting up the kingdom of Iraq and setting up the British mandate in in uh, what was then the British mandate of Palestine and so on. Uh, a lot has been written about uh, Churchill and, and the Jews and Churchill and Israel. Uh, and I, if I had to try to summarize it in a few words, I would say that Churchill was much, was more sympathetic after the war was over to the emergence of the state of Israel because he regarded the leaders of Israel, of what became Israel as people who had a European background in as the, in the original founders of the state of Israel were overwhelmingly from Europe. And he was more comfortable with the existence of a Jewish state in the Middle East than he was with India. And the other thing to keep in mind is he had less at stake personally with what happened in the Palestine mandate. Britain had, had not controlled Palestine until the Ottoman Empire lost control in World War I. That had, it, only, it only had a mandate in Palestine for 30 years. India, the British had started coming in the 17th century. They got more and more powerful in the 18th century. They established the great Raj in the 19th century. He had so much more emotion attached to India than he ever had to the Middle East. That's a great question, Mike, but it is not the question I should dwell on because I'm now seeing um, more and more questions about, uh, about this topic. And I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to find out a way to slide. Uh, I've got it. Sorry, I, there we go. The Sikh people, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of um, feeling, a lot of feeling in India about Gandhi. I mean, Gandhi was perceived for generations as the patron saint of India. 
And there are the, uh, the comment is, I'm sorry, I forgot to read, uh, from Arthur, hi Arthur, the Sikh people also hate Gandhi. Now, first of all, I, I always feel uncomfortable by saying a whole people have an attitude. I mean, but I, the fact that many Sikhs um, hate Gandhi is actually um, uh, very true because uh, they feel that he acquiesced in something that was quite drastically bad for the Sikhs. The Sikhs, uh, the, mo mo most of the Sikhs, their, ho their homeland was the Punjab part of India. And Gandhi had originally wanted to have British India remain intact and just become independent. And uh, Nehru and others persuaded him that the Muslims were so desperate to create their own state that one would have to go along with that. And Gandhi was no enthusiast for that, but did not use the full, full weight of his moral influence to try to prevent India and Pakistan from splitting apart because the line of division went right through the Punjab and huge numbers of Sikhs were on one side and not the other and there were horrible disasters and so on. So that's the main reason many Sikhs are resentful of Gandhi. I wanted to mention one thing that's still applicable. If you are on, uh, happen to be on gallery view, which I am going to switch to, uh, if you're on Valerie, or most people, are, if you if you have if you have the the screen not showing and you're willing to switch to uh, happen to want to switch to show video, I get to see more of the faces I'm talking to, and if I'm lucky, I'll even spot the person whose question I'm answering. Mm -hmm. This is from Judy M. Uh, I saw Judy uh, someplace here, but I don't know. Ah, hi. See you then. I see you waving. All right, glasses and everything. Hi. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I like seeing people who are asking the question. This question is, am I familiar with uh, George Orwell's famous piece, Shooting the Elephant? What do you think of Orwell's premise that those who had to enforce colonial power, the Raj, often in the end were emasculated while attempting to execute it? It's this famous episode where, uh, 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 thanks for asking that, this was um, in what's now Burma, Orwell is a young British uh, official in Burma, uh, a, 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 um, an elephant uh, that has a mental condition, which I guess elephants do, is running wild. And the population says, you're the British, you're the British guy, you say you're in charge, you must be the one to shoot the elephant. And from this Orwell, this whole, he didn't, you know, this whole idea of because you're in charge, you have to do these things and we count on you. And if you do it, you know, it's on this, this whole thing led to uh, Orwell's increasing aversion to the whole system of British imperialism. He felt it was bad for the British as well as being bad for the people that put them in all sorts of strange positions. But uh, yeah, it was Churchill, I, I mean, Orwell would have been with the great number of people in Britain who thought Britain should scale down its control of India. Churchill was in a minority. And uh, I'm sure if he ever read that essay, he wouldn't have liked it. Bill, uh, Bill, Bill Gruntal, how did Britain get to take over India in the first place? This is long prior to Churchill, but also a part of history, you bet. <laughs> how did, how did, uh, all right, quick history lesson. See you all tomorrow morning if you're still listening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was the great Mughal Empire in the 16th and 17th century. The British were eager to trade with the, they had the thing called the East India Company. They wanted permission. The Mughal Empire was so powerful. The British sent representatives of the East India Company to India to um, try to get permission to trade in India. And the great Mughal emperors kept them waiting sometimes for a year or two before granting them an audience. Gradually, the British were able to have little outposts in what became Calcutta, an outpost in what became Mumbai and so forth. Um, but for a long time, the British were just deferential traders permitted to trade, carry out business in the powerful Mughal Empire. But the Mughal Empire started to fall apart in the 18th century. There were tremendous conflicts for power that had very powerful uh, uh, rulers, emperors, who then the, their descendants weren't, uh, weren't 
agreeing with each other anymore. The Mughal Empire started to uh, fall apart. New powers emerged in India. Sections of India broke away from the Mughal Empire. And by the middle of the 18th century, the Mughal Empire was in steady decline. And the British and the French were hoping to take over. But the British won those wars. The British won the struggle with the French, which Europeans would be the dominant European power in India. And by early 19th century, the French were no longer a significant factor at all. The British had more and more power in India step by step. Uh, but it was not until the middle of the 19th century that the British felt they controlled enough of India to really establish the Raj and the form that it became uh, the uh, total government of India. There were lots of Indian princes, but they had to acknowledge the British Raj as the ruling power. So it was a step-by-step -step process. And uh, what a great question, Bill, and what an inadequate answer, but I see a lot of other questions. Henry, uh, I, I'm not sure I see Henry, but uh, maybe on another slide. Oh, there you are. Hi, Henry. Um, was not Gandhi also an anti-Semite based on some of the speeches in South Africa? Um, I am afraid that there is some truth in that. Um, Gandhi has, Gandhi's views of, I mean, I, I, I freely tell you that I, I know a good bit about Gandhi's life, but I have never done a, um, I have never done a, um, a really a detailed study of Gandhi in South Africa and those critical South African years. And I fully acknowledge that. But those are the years when he was still trying to think like a British person, not be, pretend he was British, but trying to think like the British. He still had all the attitudes that he picked up when he was a law student in London. He dressed that way, he acted that way. He wanted the British to accept the South Asians, the Indians in South Africa, as being more like the dominant British and Dutch uh, people, uh, the whites of South Africa, and less like the coloreds and the African blacks. He wasn't successful at it, but in the course of this attempt to show the British that the Indians in South Africa were more like the British, he would have said things and done things that I think later he very much regretted. A Peace to End All Peace is a book that uh, Larry Bloom, I think that's the book you told me a while back that you just finished reading. And uh, maybe in his closing remarks, he can give you a one or two sentence positive review of that book. That is, that is about the, the uh, post-war World War I uh, settlement. How did Roosevelt, uh, this is from Myra, hi Myra. How did Roosevelt and Churchill reconcile their opposite views on colonies when Churchill tried to persuade US to join the war? That's a great question because they never really reconciled them. Um, Churchill, of course, and Roosevelt knew this, um, wanted to preserve the British empire. The American policy was to weaken the great European empires, the British empire, the French empire, the Dutch empire of which the main element was the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia, very rich and powerful, significant powerful uh, colonial possession and the other European empires. But this issue was aware that both sides were aware of it, but Churchill and Roosevelt had such a a total commitment to first crushing Hitler and the Nazi power over Europe, and second, at the same time, defeating the Japanese power over the Pacific and the South and Southwest, Southeast Asia, that they simply put this difference that they were both aware of aside, and it kind of just got pushed aside as something that uh, they couldn't really agree on and could, could not be allowed to get in the way of their totally shared commitment to making defeating Germany and then defeating Japan the priorities in World War I. Even there they had arguments because the Roosevelt and Churchill had different ideas about the strategy for getting into Europe, should it be across the channel into France, should it be up the, the soft underbelly through Italy and so on. But um, the, the, there were 
it's an absolutely right that they did not see eye to eye because, but the thing you have to remember about Roosevelt wanting to weaken the European empires was not just the Americans saying, you know, democracy is good for everyone and this isn't democratic. It is also because without putting it ever in words, it was clear to the American leaders that America would emerge from a successful war as the number one dominant economic power in the world. And they wanted to be able to interact and trade and exchange goods and make money <coughs> all over the world and not be hindered by tariffs or other uh, restrictions imposed by European powers. It said, no, you can't do this level of economic activity in some place like India or in our colonies in Africa. So the American motivation for opposing the European colonial system had economic elements. What um, someone is quoting Churchill, I believe, as saying during the war, am I, uh, all we want is the quiet enjoyment of our vast resources acquired by violence and maintained by force. I'm not familiar with that quotation. Um, Myra, I'd be very interested if you can email me that. Jan sort. will. Hmm? Jan uh, read it. Jan hmm? will email it to you. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. I, can I'm he just, not I'm, sing it? I'm unfamiliar with that particular statement, so I don't want to comment on it. Well, it's, uh, it's from Jan. Uh, yeah, Jan. Hi, Jan. Jan. Hmm? I, I will find it and email it to you. It's, I'd uh, be interested to see yeah. it because it's, it's I, I mean, it's, a, a tr it's attributed to Churchill. Yes, yes. it is. From, from yeah. a secret meeting and in the war cabinet. I'll, I'll read it aloud. So uh, uh, the quote is, all we want is the quiet enjoyment of our vast resources acquired by violence and maintained by force. And Jan uh, uh, is going to send me that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll be very interested uh, to see the source. And uh, once I've seen the source, I will be able to form more of an opinion about it. Uh, am I correct that these that's the last, or am I missing something? Was that the last of the chat questions? Or have I not seen? I think that is the last of the chat questions. I believe so, Chris. Well, that's great. I, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it looks like we've covered it. Here we, now, now we seem to be moving to raised hands. I could take one of you <laughs> raised hands. Yeah, Chris. See them. Hi, Jerry. Hi, how are you doing? Chris, I was just wondering, did Churchill ever have any, anything to say of, about the breakup of India uh, once independence was granted into Pakistan, yeah. Bangladesh, and the new India? Yeah, that's a great question. Did, did Churchill have an opinion about the policy of the Labour government of Attlee, uh, who had sent Lord Mountbatten, the um, uh, very close relative, as we know, of the royal family, to be the last viceroy of India to uh, accede to the uh, demand by the Muslim elements for their own separate country within British India. And I, I don't recall Churchill's view of that. My instinctive feeling is that once it was clear to him that the labor government was going to grant independence, that he wouldn't have cared very much whether what was being granted independent was one country or two or three or whatever. I think he would have just said, this wasn't on my watch. And I, 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 I don't know, I'm sure some historian, and it's not me, would know, and I have some idea where to try to figure it out, or find out. But um, I just, he, he really washed his hands of the whole colonial policy. He didn't, when, uh, you know, he was the leader of the opposition. He was the leader of the opposition all through those years. He was at the head of the conservative party while the labor government was arranging all these things, sending Lord Mountbatten to India and Giving, giving specific deadlines for the independence and accepting that India and Pakistan would be separate countries and that uh, some British official who had never set foot in India would be, and thus would be neutral, would draw the line where Pakistan, East Pakistan would be separate from India and West Pakistan would be separate from India. And Churchill was aware of all this and basically, of course, he would have been expected to comment on some of this as leader of the opposition, but it just, 
the fight had gone out of him on that issue. But it's a great question uh, whether at some point or other he commented on the partition, but he wouldn't have cared very much anymore. I just want to see if there's a, uh, another, um, another, another hand went up someplace that I hadn't seen or someone using the, the little reaction to uh, raise a hand, which sometimes people do. But uh, no, these were all very interesting, uh, very important questions. And um, I, um, some of them I had a more concrete answer than others. But you know, one thing you have to remember about Churchill is um, nobody knows everything about Churchill. I mean, he was a major, major public figure for 60 years. He was very expressive. He wrote books, he gave speeches, he composed state papers, he had conversations. The official biography of Churchill, which I suspect very few people have read cover to cover, although you never know, by Martin Gilbert and the team that Martin Gilbert worked on was is something like 10 or 12 volumes long, plus all the supplementary volumes that have the full text of various documents that the official biography of Churchill. Uh, actually, I think the Churchill biography was originally started by Churchill's son, Randolph, and, the, and Martin Gilbert took over. And uh, it's an enormous uh, biography. And uh, like many other people, I've checked things here and there to you know, get some information about this or that. But um, uh, I am sure there's, there are people out there who have read the Gilbert 10, 12 volume biography of Churchill. And even anyone who has does not know a fraction of what could be known about Churchill. He's a very big topic. Now that may just sound like an excuse to not give very def definitive answers to some of these questions. The questions were all without exception excellent. The answers were somewhat better than others because there's some answers I knew more clearly than others. But I do hope, and I hope the questions reflected that, that you found the topic interesting and worth thinking about. And uh, I think I should hand things back to Larry, who is going to um, uh, say whatever you say at the end of a men's club lecture presentation. Chris, as always, uh, your presentations. Chris, um, do we get, uh, do we get, I know we're auditing your course here, your courses, when you make these, do we get credit, UBC credits for these? <laughs> sure, you got to take the exam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no papers, no exam. You, you audit a course, yeah, UBC <laughs> credit, no, well, I um I did have in my uh, UBC years, I always had auditing students and, and they, they actually would register at UBC and it would uh, they get a transcript that shows that they audited a course. Uh, and I also had people in the seniors I, I, who took I, courses I, for credit. I, they actually took courses for credit, I, I, worked I, I, as hard I, I, as the younger I, students. They got a grade. But uh, if Temple Shalom is setting up an official auditing system for men's club, lectures, then anyone whose face was still on the screen at the end of the lecture would get credit for having audited. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much. Uh, fascinating, informative, dynamic as always. Um, and uh, thank you so much everyone for coming tonight. I want everyone to stay safe and stay well. Um, Mike Levitt, uh, if you're still on,